Now, with that, I invite uh, Dr. Vidya Sagar, um, Dr. Ilam Bharati, and Dr. M. K. Rajshekar uh, to join the panel. President of Indian Society of uh, Snoring and Sleep Apnea. Um, he's trained at Children's Hospital Michigan, and um, he's trained in sleep apnea with uh, Friedman, Professor Friedman. Um, uh, Dr. Ilam Bharati is not only a highly skilled all-round otolary otolaryngologist, but also is a plastic surgeon. He practices at Bilroth Hospitals, Chennai. And Dr. M.K. Raj Shekhar, uh, uh, past director of UIORL, favorite among postgraduates, and uh, is now a HOD at Balaji Medical College. Um, let's begin the panel, please. Good evening, everyone. At the outset, I would like to thank Thiru and his team for organizing this wonderful workshop com conference, wherein I am so fortunate to be a part of. And very nice to have my teachers as my panelists. So uh, without further ado, I'll directly jump in because I have a train to catch. So uh, I think we have listened to two great lectures, sir. So but many times we do come across kids like this, whom you can see who have already been undergone uh, adenoid surgery in the past and they have come back with the history of snoring, mouth breathing, nocturnal aneurysis, choking spells. So this is a patient who has clearly undergone an adenoid surgery before. Is going on. So what would you do for them first? The feed has been... Dr. Elambarthi, sir. Yeah, good evening. So, in all these cases after adenotonsillectomy, when there is a persistent of uh, snoring and obstructive sleep apnea, we have to look for the reasons. The common reasons are, one thing is an obesity, second is an allergic rhinitis or nasal causes, third will be the syndromic child and then craniofacial anomalies. So, <laughs> to we have to examine the patient and ask for these things and we have to concentrate in these four these things to uh, clarify to find out the cause for the failure of adenotonsillectomy. That is first thing. Then naturally we have to evaluate by doing if possible flexible nasal endoscopy or later polysomnogram if necessary and then dice also to treat the patient effectively. Thank you so much sir. S uh, MK sir, this patient had undergone the adenoid surgery okay. but <coughs> on endoscopy as I suggested we still found that there was significant Adenoids. adenoid tissue. Yeah, Do you come yeah. across this kind of situation? Yes, yes. Those because days, yeah, those we days find we used that to, yeah. 80 to 90 percent. We used to do blindly. Yes. Nowadays, we are doing with endoscopy with coagulation. 100 percent we can give guarantee. Maybe that child would have undergone yes, uh, ordinary tonsillectomy. The old method, St. Clay's Thompson, yeah. adenoid curate. Yeah. So true, sir. So you so would cannot take a, a cone properly. Only uh, based on the nasopharynx, only we can remove the adenoid. Uh, the, the, the adenoid which goes inside the nose, we cannot remove it out. So I think that is a very good take home message that uh, before we were using <coughs> these surgeries blindly, but now we have the endoscopes and we have modern gadgets, both debrider and the coblators. So we are able to do much more effective removal of this. So the recurrence chances are less, but then, uh, Elambarthi sir, again to you, sometimes this patient would have undergone a wonderful adenoid surgery, but on endoscopy, Dr. Sagar, we don't find... The other two panelists are also there. Oh, okay. They us. are still online? Yes, they oh, are also okay. online. Okay. Can I take this question to Dr. Shyam, please? Dr. Shyam? Yeah, I'm here. Hi, I'm sorry. I didn't see, I didn't notice that you were no there. Problem. Yeah. So, this is a patient who had undergone a previous adenoid surgery. I don't, uh, do, can you see this endoscopy? Can you put the endoscopy? Uh, yeah, so just yeah. briefly, yeah, thank yeah. you, yeah. You can see that the adenoid removal has been almost a good one, unlike the previous one. But on the contrary, you are seeing a lot more tubal tonsils. Do you come across this kind of a problem that is causing the snoring and uh, mouth breathing? Uh, yes. Um, it does happen. It's not common, but it does happen. Um, and it may be, uh, and, and you know, I, I uh, basically in these patients very conservatively will do a um, lateral wall adenoidectomy, I guess, 
um, staying, but staying very medial on the on the medial aspect uh, of the of the, uh, the fossa of Rose and Muller, I guess we call it, to ablate the medial aspect of the adenoid, but being very careful not to um, cross over into the opening of the eustachian tube. Um, so you can ablate uh, the lateral wall adenoid. I would always do it um, under uh, endoscopic vision, so you get um, uh, you know very good visualization of what you're doing. You can see the opening of the eustachian tube uh, very clearly, um, so you don't cause any scarring. And I normally would use a coblation to do this rather than a suction diathermy because there's less um, spread of heat um, to the um, surrounding tissue. Thank you, sir. Uh, the question to Dr. Colin. So, does it mean that is it actually a residue or a recurrence <laughs> or are we uh, thinking about some other problem like maybe there is a larger issue that we are not looking forward like an allergy perhaps or because these patients would have undergone a very wonderful adenoidectomy and a tonsillectomy but they will later on develop a tubal tonsils or a lingual tonsils so do you think there is something else that is going on and we are not just addressing the uh, lymphoid tissue that we are seeing during the presentation dr colin I think the jury will be still out for that, won't it, um, what the mechanism is in place. But the argument is that you may get uh, a, a process that drives uh, any residual tissue to compensate for some of the loss elsewhere. Um, but um, it, it, it occasionally happens and uh, it's, a, it's a, on a slightly rarer side of things. And Dr. Shian, uh, you recommended that the children would be given a course of Montelukast. But recent um, studies give a red box warning of usage of Montelukast. What is your take on it? Is it okay to use the Montelukast in pediatric uh, population? Because there has been a lot of instances of uh, neuropsychiatric manifestations for the use of Montelukast. What is your take on it, please? Dr. Shian? I think your thing is frozen. Oh. Uh, Dr. Elambarati, sir, can you answer that? Yeah. So the recent guidelines, they say that it is better to avoid Montelukast in the children. At least if you want to use it, you can use it for two to three weeks, not as recommended by three months to six months, six months because of the behavioral problems or neuropsychiatric problems that has been reported in many um, uh, findings. So it is better to avoid. Instead, you can go for the INCS, the other modes of medical treatment you can follow. This is a child, uh, M. K. R. Sir. This is a child. Uh, this is a 14-year-old boy who had undergone a wonderful adenoidectomy, tonsillectomy. But on endoscopy, we found this very prominent sulfingopharyngeal folds that is almost touching each other during endoscopy, and it is causing obstruction. Is there anything we can do or do we just treat with medically? No, the, the, this patient still, I, mean, I think I still having a, a mouth breathing. Mouth breathing, yes. Sir. Yeah, you have to undergo tubal, this uh, sulfing of old ablation with a co cobulation. Okay. Uh, would you prefer a very aggressive technique like this or would you just try a, a channeling first and then if it is still persisting, would you go for it? Because this patient has already undergone a channeling before also. Oh, then you can go for aggressive. Once channeling, first you try with channeling, then you can go for aggressive. If it re recurs again, and it's record again. Yes, sir. Better you can go for aggressive. And if you are going for aggressive technique like this, is there any take home message that you would give for the younger generations regarding the possibility of developing an otitis media or something because you are being very close to the uh salping of pharyngeal fold as well as to yeah, the eustachian tube it's a very good question you have to confine yourself up to inferior part then when you go up superior part you have to be very careful you should not go so superiorly this is all only by learning curve and technique only we can we can we cannot damage the tube otherwise if you start doing first you may likely to injure the auditory tube thank you so much sir so uh dr colin 
I think um, uh, the nasal surgery has been very nicely dealt with by Dr. Shyan. But let's say if there is no static obstruction like this, but on the floor of the nasal cavity, you see some elevation. Is there something more you would look for? Or is there something else we could address apart from the static obstructions like this? Can you show me the picture? Can you show the picture? Yeah. So here, this child was having a hyoged palate. So, um, is there a role for uh, either a SARME or SARPE, which is like a surgical assisted rapid maxillary ex expansion or a surgically assisted uh, palatal rapid palatal expansion? When would you consider that? And when would you consider a dome like uh, distraction osteogenesis with media uh, maxillary expansion? So we consider distraction based on uh, your, this is where your dice becomes a bit more important. So it depends on the level of obstruction. Um, and so um, I, well, our group tends to reserve it for those with severe micronathia. So particularly the distractions. Um, and the mid-face approach is uh, only addressed if you are truly yeah. concerned whether there's going to be some mid-face stenosis. Dr. Shyan is back here. Can we ask the same question to Dr. Shyan as well? Yeah. Because I think he, he touched based on the orthodontic things. I mean, I think um, most of the um, orthognathic, orthodontic stuff will be dealt with by uh, in our multidisciplinary team, um, which has a plastic surgeon, a maxillofacial surgeon, and orthodontists. Um, and essentially, you know, I think... I would probably uh, leave it up to them to make the decision. Um, kids under the age of, uh, you know, eight or so um, do respond quite well to maxillary expansion. Um, as they get older, uh, you have less um, um, benefit from uh, non-orthognathic uh, procedures such as um, expansion devices, then you need to think about orthognathic surgery, um, either uh, a, a medial um, split uh, maxillectomy and expansion uh, or something along those lines. But really, we tend to leave, I, I, look, I, I, we talk about it in our clinic, but I, I leave the decisions up to the orthognathic surgeons and the orthodontists in the room. I think you have very clearly mentioned the pro probable indications for both SARME and SARPE, which is around the age of 8, 9, 10. In those stages, you would consider that if there is a hyoch palate and on endoscopy, you find a, a floor of the no nose to be elevated without any other nasal problems. But if the ch child is around 14, 15, 16, then you would have to consider a dome as the possible uh, procedure. Uh, so now, uh, this is a child who had already undergone a tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy and he comes to my clinic and in the clinic itself, while we are examining and talking, he is sleeping like this, sir. So, uh, and he also snores heavily. I think you can listen to the snoring also. Yeah, yeah. So, how would you go about for this child? Yeah, this is a typical obese child who has undergone adenotonsillectomy. So, we have to consider the obesity and the BMI. And we have to do polysomnogram in this patient to find out the uh, level of the obstructive sleep apnea. So, and we have to give instructions for the obesity control. And if you do endoscopy, the commonest finding we see in these patients is lingual tonsil hypertrophy. So that is one of the commonest causes of persistent OSA after adenotonsillectomy. So address these two things, that is uh, OSA, obesity, and also lingual tonsil. And if there is an allergic rhinitis, treat the allergic rhinitis. He will do better. Thank you, sir. But uh, this patient, because he was snoring and sleeping heavily, we didn't have to take him to uh, endoscopist, I mean, uh, OT, OT to do a dice. We were able to do, very fortunate to do a OT. natural sleep endoscopy, wherein he was sleeping, not even moving while I was doing a flexible scopy in the clinic. So, 
there was not much of adenoid tissue there was not much of tonsillar tissue but you could see that there was a clear cut uh, collapsibility of the pharynx like a pharyngo malacia component was seen so this patient is not syndromic but there is a uh, pharyngo malacia how often you get pharyngo malacia how do you evaluate it uh, how do you go about no pharyngo malacia is not very common when you compare it with the other forms of laryngo tracheo bronchio malacia and most of the obese patients they will have little bit laxity of the pharyngeal musculature what we call it as uh, that is one of the causes for pharyngo malacia so naturally our uh, polysomnogram also is going to give assess the severity of the osa and in all these patients the main modality of treatment is uh, dieting and weight control which will definitely improve the uh, problem in these patients M K R sir, your opinion. If the patient has been put on diet conservative management, and if still the collapse is present like this in the velopharynx, and oropharynx and hypopharynx are literally okay. Okay. So can you proceed with any surgical option yeah, in pediatric age group? Yeah, we can try with uh, very simple one. Barbosa technique can be done. Okay. Very simple one, and it will not make much problem to the patient. This patient. Okay. Because it will tighten the soft palate. Very nice, sir. So uh, I think yes. sir has mentioned about the barbed pharyngoplasty we did the uh, uh, expansion ESP. sphincter uh, ESP expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty where we just roughened the tonsillar area so that we were able to see the uh, posterior pharyngeal muscle that is the palto pharyngeus muscle and we were able to uh, create a tunnel through which we were able to uh, bring the palto pharyngeus muscle to the pterygoid hamulus area and uh, we were able to do it on both sides uh, i'm sorry i think we were able to do it on both sides the expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty and at the end of the expansion sphincter pharyngoplasty you can see that the there was a significant widening of the contact with the there is a significant widening of the uh, velopharynx area which was collapsing before in the previous dice that is the drug induced sleep endoscopy and this is the post operatively the child I after this procedure bona va bona gorak tadi penda so in the post operative picture he has lost about few pounds few pounds possibly because of the surgery <laughs> or maybe because, because not eating hurting. properly not eating properly <laughs> so two more two weeks he cannot eat because we are injuring the palate and uh, uh, tonsils so naturally you reduce the weight okay thank you sir uh, dr shyan uh, how often you use propofol in your place and what is the role of bis monitoring in a pediatric child would you go for a dexmedetomidine instead or you would still go ahead with propofol or midazolam dr shyan if you are that we um we use uh propofol um as part of our guys um um a guys protocol all right so, so does the so propofol does it not accentuate the hypopharyngeal collapse when compared to dexmedetomidine or do you use a bis um, monitor yeah pro possibly yes um but it's it's um it's built into our protocol um and um and and for uh consistency it's and it's a drug that most of our anesthetists use all the time uh, it's very easy to use it's measurable um so that's uh, our dice protocol is uh, uses uh, a propofol rather than dexmedetomidine uh it's just medical expertise thank you so much sir uh dr mk sir how often do you get static obstructions to be the cause for uh your tongue based lesions like uh, a lingual thyroid for per se or a lingual tonsils how often do you get them in, so, your, in our practice in practice, a pediatric age group? pediatric is very rarely okay this a this a congenital anomaly is actually thyroglossus is a congenital anomaly okay so and what about rarely. lingual thyroid sir lingual how thyroid very rarely it? adult we will get it Okay. So the re reaction of the reactive tissue. Once, if you do tonsillar anatomy, lingual tonsils go for hypertrophy. 
but uh, i don't think i have not seen so much in my case thank you sir elambarith sir if there is a child like this with the lingual thyroid would you address it endoscopically or would you have to go for the open approach or what else we can yeah do? after investigating for normal thyroid it is better to address it endoscopically but i have it is not very uncommon i have seen few patients with lingual thyroid and also supraglottic cyst also causing the um, obstruction producing snoring and final question to dr colin how often do you see a child who has um, a bilateral vocal cord paralysis and for whom uh, there is like uh, cpap that has been given without a proper evaluation dr colin sorry you might have to say the question again because i, I was a child with okay. bilateral vocal cord palsy who has been yeah. misdiagnosed with uh, obstructive sleep apnea and been given even a cpap yeah have you yeah, come across it, it, it happens but it's quite rare but okay. um it it is something occasionally happens and they've overcome the obstructive element with cpap um but ultimately they need different treatment options thank you thank you so much sir thank you everyone for your patient listening and i think uh, with this a few take home messages i would like to thank the organizers for giving us this wonderful opportunity and thank you for my teachers uh, thank you sir always it is yes. a pleasure to have a panel with you because it is always informative vidya huh? thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you all thank you dr sagar for a very well conducted panel i think we are done for the day dr thiru thank you sir thank you thank you all uh, both the panelist uh, um, faculty and uh, more than anything else the delegates i have never seen people sitting for the last uh, uh, you know uh, oration or uh, panel generally people slowly will start uh, uh, moving but uh, today uh, i have got a chance to talk to you <laughs> at the end so anyway uh, tomorrow is going to be the hectic day of uh, the 3 day conference because we are starting by 8 o'clock sharp tomorrow morning and uh, we have uh, you know something like uh, this plenty of uh, panel discussions and also tomorrow we have uh, live uh, scopes and live surgeries so we are planning to do one or two endoscopic uh, surgery tomorrow so it is going to be a very hectic day till uh, um, evening so uh, breakfast will be served in the morning please come here by 7:30 to have breakfast and then continue the um uh, uh, no lectures uh, by 8 o'clock okay thank you all thanks for the patient listening thanks for staying out till the end thank you